Hi, I'm Paul Brownstein, a lawyer here in Laura Bucks County, Southampton, PA. We have a family practice and I do a great deal of that kind of work. And I represent both men and women, plaintiffs and defendants. And in the previous video, I talked a lot about how people sometimes divide up the tangible assets when there's a divorce. The tangible assets are things that are obvious, things like houses, cars, even money in the bank. But there's a much more significant issue in most divorce cases that has to do with things that are intangible. Things like retirement benefits, timeshares, investments, stock options, and those sorts of things. And they are sometimes surprising to people because they don't think that there's anything in a divorce except what you can put your hand on and actually use. And often a person who's got the benefit, a retirement plan, a 401k, an investment account, and those sorts of things, they are somewhat distressed to find out that while they earned it and they put the money into it, all the years of the marriage, that notwithstanding, the spouse gets a share of it. And I say he advisedly because sometimes it's the wife who has all those assets and very often both parties have those kind of assets. And when there are assets of that sort, they do get calculated and shared between the parties in a divorce action. They don't have to be. There are sometimes people who make a decision. I want to keep mine. The other side can keep theirs and we're square. And very often, if it's not a very long marriage or if people are well situated equally well, it could be just about fine. You each keep your own because the balance of the asset in calculations may not be much different anyway. But many times there is a great deal more on one side than the other, sometimes not on the other side. Even here in this part of the 21st century, women very often have less than men. It's a product of what has been going on for a long time in economics. And maybe that's changing, but still you frequently find a wife has spent her time in the house caring for the kids, doing her part to help husband make a good career and not doing uh, very much in business. And as a consequence, may not have much in the way of separate assets, meaning in her own name, where the husband is sometimes in that spot himself. I've had more than a few stay at home dads and they are then in what is the common wife's position. I had a complaint yesterday in court from the other side who was saying, why does my wife get any of these assets after all? That's not right. It's not fair. And as I've often said in these videos, the word fair is just not in the legal dictionary, except for the fact that it is the law and it's equitable. It's reasonable. There's nothing fair about giving the other party something that you've earned. But as a judge once explained it perfectly well, and it's a good guideline in this instance, it is simply because if you were partners in a business, 50-50 partners, and one of the partners is a lazy no good and does nothing, and the partnership breaks up, that doesn't mean that that partner doesn't get half. The same thing applies in a marriage, because in a way, a marriage is a contract. Everybody remembers your marriage vows. In sickness and in health, richer for poorer, until death does do part. They forget the other part they commonly say, and all my worldly goods I thee endow. So what I want to talk about today is the distribution of those worldly goods. The same formula applies with some exceptions as it would for tangible property. You add up what everything is worth today. What's the value? What it is a retirement plan? It's the portion of the retirement plan, the percentage that is, not the number, that was accrued as of the date that the marriage broke up. Often the date of separation, but not necessarily. It may have been the date the marriage was, as it says, irretrievably broken. You can be living separate and apart in the same house and still be irretrievably broken and Allah will look at that. But whatever that date was, that establishes the percentage of the asset that is available for distribution because the amount that's available is what was accrued in retirement plans from the date of marriage until the date of separation. Again, I emphasize not the value, but the percentage. So if, for example, you had the asset for 20 years, but married for 10, 10 over 20, one half of the total value is what's available for distribution. After separation, very commonly, the continuing increase in value 
and contributions to a retirement plan are nevertheless still available for distribution in value as of the date that the divorce is finalized. But the portion of it that's available is that percentage, years of marriage over years that you've had it. If you started it during the marriage, it's 100% available. If you had it for twice as long, half is available. But what percentage is it that is going to be split between the parties? This is a formula that the court applies as a set of guidelines. There are a number of factors. Things like length of the marriage, economic disparity in income, health of the parties, future earning prospects, care of children who are minors, a number of factors. Basically, even though this is not really accurate, it gives a good understanding, the longer the marriage and the bigger the economic disparity, often income difference, the more likely it will not be a 50-50 split. When you watch television, you see things going on there. You're watching programs usually made in California where they have community property. Everything is 50-50. And none of that percentage stuff I mentioned a minute ago, all of it. So if you're a person who got divorced more than once, each time there's a little less to be split up because the other spouse got half, now there's less than half to buy up with the new spouse. And it becomes rather difficult. But in Pennsylvania, they don't count what you had before the marriage. They only count what you had during the marriage. And the percentage of that that the other spouse might get or that you might keep is a ratio based upon those factors. It sounds very scientific and mathematical. We have all these factors. Let's say there's 11. You add them up, you divide by 11, that must be the number. No, they're simply different factors and it's fairly unscientific. But there is a pretty good track record in Pennsylvania and in the counties where I work in what historically they do with certain given facts. So ordinarily, the outcome is fairly predictable. You can tell in a long-term marriage, say 20 years, and a differential income, maybe husband has three times as much income as wife, it wouldn't be shocking at all for it to be 55 or 60% or maybe more for the wife and the differential of that for the husband or vice versa, of course, if the wife is doing better. Well, when you think about that for a minute, why would a spouse who's giving more to the other spouse that's getting divorced get more? The rationale is the state wants to leave the parties in some sense of parity. Where were they when they were married and lived with each other? And although that partnership story I told you, 50-50 is charming, they don't do 50-50 automatically. It's equitable distribution. That's what it's called, equitable. Sounds like equal. It doesn't mean equal. As I've already said, it doesn't mean that it's fair. <laughs> That's how you do it. Well, how do you make the division come to pass? Well, if the case is going to be taken into account, we're going to transfer, as you might have to in some cases, a portion of the retirement from one spouse to the other. Everybody knows if you cash out early, there's tax consequences and penalties. In a divorce case, specifically, under Pennsylvania rules, you can split the assets by rolling over a share of it from one spouse to the other. If it is an ERISA benefit, that means one covered by the federal law that controls pensions and retirement plans. It's what gives you the right to deposit money in the account to your income and not pay taxes on it and take it out later when supposedly you're going to be at a lower tax consequence and take it out then and that's the whole idea of this deferral of money you put in. Well, the same thing's true in this instance. You're going to say, wait a minute, I'm taking out early. Am I not going to get taxed for that because I took it out early? And the answer is no, you don't because you can write, prepare a special kind of court order called a Qualified Domestic Relations Order, Q-D-R-O. And lawyers like me say the word quadro. That's what it means. I knew one lawyer once who called it a quadro. It's the same thing, QDRO. And what do you do? We often hire an outside outfit to do it because it's actuarially computed. And it's a lot cheaper and simpler in the end to get a professional who does it all the time for a modest fee than to pay a lawyer to do it who doesn't do it every day. And the truth is, it's a lot more useful for the lawyer not to do it. It's quicker, less chance of a mistake, and somebody to go to complain to, not me, if something doesn't go exactly right, because you're usually a reputable person. And pretty typically, the parties share that relatively modest cost. It is in thousands. It's a few hundred. They prepare the quadro. It then gets sent to the plan administrator to be approved. 
because not always is the detail in that quadro going to satisfy how the plan likes to operate itself. And when that's done and they approve it, which can take a while, I'm sorry to have to tell you, people think it's going to be instantaneous. It can take weeks, and I've had cases where it took months because the plan administrator is busy and not particularly interested in knowing that the parties are anxious to get the divorce done. They're doing their job in due course. And when they finally get it done and they approve it, then the parties approve it by signing it. We then send it in to the judge, who routinely will sign us something electrifyingly wrong with it. Usually not. They send it back to us. We send it to the plan. The plan implements it. And the receiving spouse needs to have an ERISA sheltered benefit to put it into. It could be an IRA. It could be a 401k. It could be a 403b. It could be any kind of benefit which you may have to establish to get it rolled over. You don't get it in cash. I've seen people want to do that. There will definitely be tax consequences then. And that could be a real problem when it comes time for a spouse saying, I want the money. And the other spouse saying, then you pay the tax consequence and nobody's happy. So this is how it's commonly done. Now, not true for all such benefits. Certain kinds of benefits cannot be quadroed. For example, a government or military one, you normally have to be married and living together before the marriage is broken for at least 10 years while earning that benefit, or there's no such benefit available under ordinary circumstances. And I've had cases where it was 10 years and one day, that's good, and I had one a while ago, it was nine years and three months and nothing was available. And that's the law, I don't control the law. The bad joke, which I want to say in signing off here is really, it's not my circus, they're not my monkeys, I just blow the whistle here. But then again, this is important stuff and worthwhile knowing. And again, I hope obviously, not something that you should try to do yourself. It's easy to make mistakes and have bad consequences. And so when you think for a minute, this is your life, and your money and your property. It's easy to make a decision. When you think about it for a minute and you realize this is only your life and your money and your property, don't try to do this yourself. When it really matters, the choice is simple.